morning, everybody. So good to see everybody here. You know, at JCF, we are blessed to have uh, a teaching team that's not just, you know, seminary trained, uh, you know, students or graduates, but also, you know, lay people like myself, Mike, and so forth. Uh, and uh, the other thing is this, um, you know, we, this yesterday morning at our elders' uh, retreat, you know, we do that like twice uh, a year. We were talking about, you know, what are some of the teaching topics which is relevant and which is necessary. And so this morning, when I listened to uh, what our speaker, Alan Banhart, talked about, I say actually, that's one of the messages that we should be hearing. And so Alan is one of the a businessmen. You know, when I first uh, came back from the U.S., uh, having graduated and working, we were looking for role models, you know, someone that we can look up to, someone who can, we can learn how to do well in business. You know, not just doing well, but you know, how to live the Christian life. Yeah. And among other things is, you know, what do you do with wealth? What do you do with money? Because like Larry, Larry Bouquet, one of the founders of Crown Financial Ministry, mentioned that actually money is the number one competitor for the love of Christ in our life. And so about, um, I think about 13, 14 years ago, I have the, you know, the pleasure of uh, meeting uh, Alan. And I, uh, before that, I was reading about his life. And it's, it's such a great testimony about how God has his work in his life and his business. So I got to see him. And, I, and the thing is, uh, I say, that's the real stuff. That's the authentic, you know. And uh, the thing is, not only the way, you know, he handles the money, but the joy, you know, the, the joy and the freedom uh, that, uh, you know, he does it with. And so, I, uh, I'm glad, you know, today we have Alan to speak to us. Um, you know, he's, again, my role model and my, my friend. Yeah, please, Alan. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe before that, uh, let me pray. Yeah. Our Father, we just thank you for the blessings that you have been given, uh, giving to us here at GICF. Father, we thank you for all the people that have come, you know, from from afar to be a blessing to us here in Indonesia. Father, just as we look around too, we see, you know, so many foreigners, Father, you know, people who come and bless us. And we're just thankful for the unity that we have in Christ Jesus. Father, we also want to thank you for bringing Alan over to speak to us. And we pray, Father, that our hearts will be open, our hearts will be soft, Father, so that the, the words that you speak, Father, that we'll be able to to hear and we'll be able, uh, to, you know, that it will transform our lives, Father, so that our lives will be different, so that we will be able to live like what Jesus says, that I've come so you could have life and life to the fullness. So thank you once again, Father, for bringing Alan to, to Indonesia. I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit will speak, will speak to us through him. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Soprano. What a joy to be with you guys. It's my first trip to Indonesia. I've been all over the world, and I've never been to Indonesia, so I'm, it's a treat. And to be among you guys on the Lord's Day, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for being able to, allowing, us to allowing me to come and share our story. Um, I'm, I'm Alan Barnhart from Tennessee, from Memphis, Tennessee. I have an amazing wife, Catherine. that better? Ah, perfect. I have an amazing wife, Catherine. Let me say that twice. And, uh, and she is, um, she has been to Indonesia multiple times and, and, and she's very involved with all kinds of different ministries. I also have six children and four of them are married. So now we have 10, uh, and then, and then they've had started having children. And so now we have seven grandchildren. And so that has been a great treat and kind of a fun part of life. Um, the business that I'm in is very secular. It's nothing spiritual about it. From a, We pick up and move heavy stuff. Um, so our customers are oil refineries and power plants and paper mills and steel mills. Anybody who has big heavy stuff to be picked up, we have a fleet of cranes and trucks and specialty equipment and a bunch of engineers that try to figure out how we can move 
heavy stuff. And we only, only work in the United States. We, work, we have 50 branches across the United States um, picking up and moving heavy stuff. And uh, that may sound boring, but we like it. It's fun. It's physical. It's real. And, uh, and I tell people I have a very boring resume. Uh, I've worked for the same company since I was 10 years old. And I've done nothing else but that. So how's that for a boring resume? It, uh, but it hasn't been a boring life. It's been a life filled with joy, as you said. Um, the, uh, I, I didn't grow up in a Christian family, but I came to Christ through a ministry called Young Life, who came out to my high school and shared the gospel in a ways that high school kids could understand. And they talked about this God who created the world and loves us. And then they were... were they were good enough to us to tell us the bad news of our sin and how our sin has created a separation with God and how each of us in our own way has shaken our fist at God and say, I want to be my own God. I want to do it my way. And, uh, and how that creates a separation, that sin. And, uh, but then they followed that up with the message of the cross and how Jesus coming and paying the penalty that I had earned as he died on the cross, and then the resurrection, how he rose. and, and um, So I heard that message when I was 15 years old, and I embraced it, and I started slowly to grow in my faith. And then I went off to the university, and a lot of people, when they go to the university, kind of uh, maybe put off their faith and start living a different life. And, and for me, it was the opposite, actually. I connected with some other people who were growing in their faith, and we, for four years at the university, it was a time of spiritual growth for me. Learned how to pray together and study scripture together, learned how to worship together and serve together. It was an f- amazing time. And uh, I had studied engineering with the plan of coming back and working in the family business that I'd basically grown up in. It was a very small business. It was a mom and pop, we call it. And, and the international corporate headquarters was two bedrooms of our home that I grew up in. And we, uh, we had about 10 employees, and it was just a very small company. And we, uh, so as I was considering, plan, planning to move back to Memphis to start working, some of my friends were saying, Alan, you, should, you shouldn't do that. You should go to seminary. Or you should go on staff with Young Life. Or go into full-time Christian work. Do something significant with your life. And I was praying about that, and I said, God, I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll do whatever you want me to do. I do want to do something significant in my life. And as as I worked through that, though, with God, I came to the conclusion that all of us who are followers of Jesus are in full-time ministry. A few of us We'll get our paycheck from a charity or a church. The rest of us will get a paycheck from somewhere else. But all of us are called to use our skills and gifts full-time to serve God. And I came to the conclusion that God had gifted me more in the area of business and engineering than he had in preaching or or writing or counseling. And so that my full-time ministry was going to be in the area of business. And so I came back and started working for the family business. And uh, I'd learned in college to study scripture. So I decided that I would read through the Bible and see what it had to say about business and about money. And uh, it said a lot. (laughs) There were thousands of verses about money. And uh, Jesus warned about money 10 times more than he warned about anything else. It's pretty interesting. So I'm a young guy. I'm 23, 24 years old. I'm going through the Bible and cataloging. I'm an engineer, so I'm cataloging these verses. And, uh, and I came away with two primary takeaways that shaped the rest of my life. The first one was the concept of stewardship, that everything I have, not 10%, but everything I have has come from God and belongs to God. I'm not an owner that has rights to anything. I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. I need to figure out what God wants me to do with all of the stuff that he gives me, my talent, my treasure. I need to be a steward and not an owner. Um, the, The second thing may surprise you a bit. 
The second thing was I came away with a fear that business success could really seriously be detrimental to my spiritual life. It might hurt me. And uh, part of the scoreboard in business is making money, uh, making a profit. That's, you know, that's part of what a business is there to do. Um, it's not the only scoreboard, but it's part of it. And I kept seeing all these warnings in Scripture about money. Let me, let me read a few of them to you. Um, you know, Matthew 19 is kind of that famous verse that says, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Ouch. They went through that camel. It's easier to get a camel through the eye of a needle than for a rich man. It's like, wow, that's, that's rough. Um, in Matthew 6, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, don't store up treasure for yourself on earth. That's not what our financial advisors tell us. But he says, don't store up treasure for yourself on earth. And he says, but do store up treasure for yourself in heaven. And I thought, well, I'm going to be in heaven a lot longer than I'm going to be here. So that does make sense. But there is sort of this natural tendency to want to try to store up things for ourselves that we need to combat. He goes on in the same chapter to talk about you can't serve two masters. There's something about money creates a separation between us and God. What is he? The number one competitor for God is money. Um, you can't serve God and money. And then he goes on to say, but by the way, guys, don't worry. Don't be anxious. And he goes through a whole litany of things that we should not be anxious about. Even food and clothing we should not be anxious about. And a lot of people spend a huge amount of their time in anxiety and a lot of times it's about stuff, and God says, don't do that, and he's trying to set us free. In Matthew 13, there was the parable of the soils, the four soils, and we all want to be that fourth soil, that rich, fruitful, abundant soil that yields a huge fruit, a huge crop. Um, and I wasn't so worried about the first two soils because those were soils where there was no, they had not embraced faith or there was no roots to the faith and, and I, I knew that I had some roots, but that third soil is pretty scary. Good roots, good plant, good soil, no fruit. And as Jesus explained it, he said, what happened here was the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of wealth is what choked out the fruit. And I didn't want that to be my story, but I knew that it might be. And that's why Jesus kept warning um, there's this, the um, warnings that God gives when he's in Malachi 3 where he says, hey, you're robbing from me. You're stealing from me. And, uh, and they say, what do you mean we're stealing from you? And, and he said, you're stealing from me because you're not bringing your tithes into the storehouse. You're not doing, what you're, what we, what, we, you're not doing your end of the deal, so to speak. And then he says, test me in this. What, bring your tithe into the storehouse and then see what happens. And I've got plenty to give you, and I will pour out things for you. Now, this isn't a prosperity gospel. The, the, the blessings that God pours out most often won't have dollar signs attached to them, um, but they, uh, they are real. The, uh, in Luke 12, Jesus um, starts out and in 12, 15, he says, watch out. Be on your guard against all forms of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of your possessions. And then he tells a story. I'm going to read it to you so I don't get it wrong. Um, and then he told them this parable right after he had said, watch out. He said, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, now, you think what he could have done at that point. I have no place. I have so much that I can't even store it all. So he could have been exceedingly generous at that point in his life. What did he do? He said, this is what I'll do. I got a great idea. 
I will tear down my barns, and I will build bigger ones. And there I will store up my surplus grain. And I will say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Here comes the bad news. And then God said to him, you guys remember what he said? He said, you fool. He called him a fool. Wow. He said, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And then Jesus closes that section by saying, this is how it is with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich toward God. And that's scary. There's such a tendency to keep building bigger barns, and God says, don't do it. That's not the way to life. Um, later on in the same chapter, he, Luke 12, man, just read that chapter, and that'll probably take care of you, okay? But if you read Luke 12 and 1 Timothy 6, you're going to get enough uh, to digest in this whole area to keep you uh, on your toes for quite a while. But later in Luke 12, he says, don't worry. Again, don't worry about stuff. And, and then he says, sell your stuff and give to the poor, and you will get purses that will not wear out. It's, again, sort of tr transferring things ahead. Um, he goes on to say, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. And then he also says, to whom much is given, much is required. That's... That's a little scary. So I'm reading all these verses as a young guy. Check this one out. Um, 1 Timothy 6, and the whole chapter is great, but starting in verse, um, in verse 6, it says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, we can take nothing out of it. If, but if we have food and clothing... We will be content with that. So far, so good. It gets worse. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. That's rough. And then he says, but here's, here's the alternative. The next verse. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. So he gave us a, a way away from these, these stark warnings. So um, I'm reading all these verses and becoming fearful. And uh, I'm working for my parents. And I fell in love with Catherine during this time. And we got engaged to be married. And two weeks later, we went to this big missions conference called Urbana. And so we're 15,000 college students come and hear about what God's doing around the world. This was 1984. And uh, they were talking there about parts of the world where missionaries were not allowed to go. They were locked out. And so it was very difficult. This was before internet and all that kind of, you know, it was very difficult to get the message of the gospel into certain places in the world. But engineers could go into those places and get jobs there. And so we talked about it, and we said, let's, let's do that. Let's go to a closed country and uh, become sort of undercover missionaries. And so we started preparing to do that. Six months later, we got married, and people said to us, don't, don't go on the mission field your first year of marriage. Stay back and, and you know, be married. And, then, and so we were, we were trying to learn this language and trying to get ready to go. And about halfway through that year, my parents came to us, and they said, uh, listen, we have decided that we are going to leave the company. I mean, they started it. They've been running it. 
we're going to leave the company here in three or four months, and we're going to get on a sailboat, and we're going to sail around the world. And they did it. I mean, just the two of them. Off, they bought a boat in Finland, and for the next, most of the next seven years, they were on that boat sailing around the world. How crazy is that? So they said, if you want to go on the mission field, we'll just sell the company. But if you want to stay and do some of those things that you've talked about, um, uh, things that we, the way I thought the company should be different, you can, you can do that. Well, man, it set up a real struggle for Catherine and I about what does God want us to do? Uh, should we go on the mission field? We kind of thought that was going to be short term. We figured if, if we had much success at all, we would get kicked out and we'd probably come back. Um, but we, we weren't sure. And long story short, we decided to talk to my brother about, you know, can we be compatible partners in a business? I, was, I have a brother and we were working together every day. We started talking about all these verses and many others and all these warnings. And we said, listen, if we're going to become partners, we need to make sure that business success doesn't hurt us. We need to put some safeguards in our life. This business may not make it the first year. I mean, it's a mom and pop business. Mom and pop are leaving. And you know, I'm a 25-year-old kid. We may, this thing may crash. But just in case, we need to say, if, if God chooses to prosper this business, we need to make sure that it doesn't hurt us. So we put two safeguards in our life, and, uh, and I would recommend them to you. The first safeguard was we settled the concept of stewardship with our wives together. We said God owns everything we have, including this company. Technically, my brother and I each owned half of the company, but and we said, God, we give this company to you. We prayed, and we, we said, this is your company. And the second thing we did to avoid some of the dangers of wealth is we put a cap on our lifestyle. We said, we're going to live a certain lifestyle, and if God chooses to prosper this business, we're not going to see it as a call to ratchet up our lifestyle Instead, we're going to see it as an opportunity to do something that's much more fun, and that is to uh, engage in the kingdom and be able to take that money and use it for kingdom purposes. And so, uh, again, we weren't sure if there'd ever, ever be any profit, but if there was profit, we were going to take half of the profit each year and send it to ministry and use the other half to um, grow the business. And so that was our commitment. And we together prayed, and then we decided, then we went ahead and became partners and started this new business, which was really a continuation of my parents' business. And the first year, we, got to, we worked crazy hard. I probably worked 100 hours a week the first year because my mom was harder to replace than my dad. I got to tell you, it was, it was rough. And uh, so we were just working like crazy and running cranes during the day and working at night. It was a really tiny, you know, small business. Um, and, uh, but the first year we made some money and we, we had uh, $50,000 that we were able to send out to ministries. We thought, this is amazing. And we, then it was a question of where on earth do we send it? You know, you would think giving away money is easy. It, it's not. And you can do more harm than good by giving away money. And so we decided to do it as a group. So we got six of us together. And we said, God, what do you want us to do with your $50,000? And we prayed and we did some research and we sent it out to maybe 10 groups or so. And uh, the next year, the company grew. And it was like, we had $150,000. We're like, this is amazing. And we added a few more people, and we figured out, and we kind of started asking other people about how to give money away better, and learned about how to do that more, and sent that money out. And the next year, it was more. And the next year, it was more. And the company just started growing at about 25% a year um, up until 2008. And so it went from this little bitty company with 10 employees to a company with 1,000 employees and, and um, you know, doing $250 million of revenue and just really booming. Um, we went from giving tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands to millions to tens of millions. And, uh, 
And I want to say, whenever I put up numbers like that, people are like, wow, that's amazing. And it is a pretty, pretty wild story. It's an amazing, we serve an amazing God who has done an amazing thing. And we've never given away a nickel that God didn't give to us. We're just trying to be a good conduit. And God keeps bringing talented people in and all, all kinds of opportunities and miracles. And we're just, we're we just continue to live the same lifestyle. And it's not some sacrificial Mother Teresa lifestyle. I mean, we have vehicles and air conditioning and food. And I mean, we're, we're living just fine. Don't feel sorry for us at all, please. <laughs> but, uh, but at the same time, we're avoiding some of the pitfalls of sort of increasing wealth, which has been wonderful. And we're getting to participate with amazing brothers and sisters in Christ around the world who are doing hard things in hard places, and he lets us be part of it. And that has been a joy. Um, when I talk about the numbers, I think this year the number is going to be $35 million that God has sent through our company. Next year, I think it'll be $40 million. And it's just, those numbers kind of get staggering. But I want to tell you, I don't think that God is impressed with the commas and the zeros. The size of the number is not impressive to God. I think that some gifts that I made in college were sacrificial gifts that I think were more pleasing to God than the $40 million we're sending out today. You know, God has brought this in. We're sending it out. I mean, what is the, what is the Hall of Fame giving story in Scripture? The widow's might. The widow, it's not some major donor that's put a lot of money into something. It's the widow's might. That's the one that Jesus said, check that one out. So please don't get caught up in the magnitude of the numbers. I think what we did the first year set ourselves on a trajectory, and then God did the rest. And we're just trying, you know, we've watched God do amazing things with this company that we gave him when we didn't know if it would even survive. And now that he's done more and more and more, why, why should we along the way say, now it's ours? Um, it didn't make sense to us. Which led up to another decision that we made in 2007, 2008. The company grew a lot and became worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And so um, in our country, there's, a, there's a, a tax. And if one of us were to have died, then... 50% of that person's uh, estate would be paid to the government. And so, and for most estates, it's, uh, if it's a small estate, it's no problem. You don't have to pay it. But if it's a big estate, you have to pay half of it to the government. Well, that's a lot of money. And in our view, it was God's money. And so we started trying to, with our advisors, figure out how we could avoid this just in case one of us died. And there's all kinds of ways of doing it. Um, but they were all expensive and burdensome. And then we looked at each other and said, you know, this is God's company. Let's just see if we can give it away. And so we went to our advisors and we said, we want to we wanna give our company away. And they thought that was a really bad idea. <laughs> they said, I mean, you're in your 40s and this thing's worth hundreds of millions. You can't do that. And we said, no, we, we really think that's what God wants us to do. And... Uh, and so, long story short, we worked through it with another organization, and we were able to take 99% of our company and put it into a charitable trust, and uh, they wouldn't take 100%. They wouldn't take control of the business, so we continue to control it and operate it, and, uh, and we are still doing that today. That 1% is now in another trust, so, I don't, so we own nothing of the company now except the stewardship of it. And we still work just as hard as we ever worked. Uh, since we gave it away, the company has more than doubled in size and, and more than that in value. Um, and so we're, we're just continuing each day to try to run a good business, to do it in a way where we're having a positive effect on each of our people in our company, um, trying to generate money. I mean, the purpose of our business, what we would put up on the wall, the purpose of our business is to glorify God by developing people to use their skills and gifts in his service through constructive work. We think doing good work is glorifying to God. Coming up with a good strategy or developing a new tool 
to me is just as glorifying as, to God as writing a cool song. I think using our skills and gifts in his service brings him glory. The second thing, the second element of that would be personal witness. We want to communicate who God is to people around us, and there's tons of people around us that, that don't know. And I think most people reject Jesus on bad information. And so we want to make sure we can get people good information about who Jesus is. Everybody has to make their own choice on that, but to be able to get them good information. And then the third element of that is, is ministry funding. So taking 50% of our profits each year and sending them out. And, uh, and again, that's not something that's... Uh, I think making the commitment in 86 was something that we felt God helped us with and gave, gave to us. And the rest of it has been God. And we've just been trying to be faithful to what we decided um, 37, 38 years ago. It has been... It has been a joy to do it. It's not been some sacrificial life like, oh, man, you're giving up so much. We've given up none of the good stuff. I mean, life has been great for us. And living a simple life, to me, is really beneficial. Godliness with contentment is great gain. And you don't achieve contentment by getting what you want. You achieve contentment by enjoying what you have. And we taught our kids this. My wife did an amazing job of teaching our kids contentment. Um, you know, so our kids didn't grow up as rich kids, and I think that really helped them. Um, you know, our kids were human beings, and there were times they wanted things that, that didn't fit into our lifestyle, and, and that was okay. We, sometimes we had to say no to things. In fact, I, I taught them the theology from the Rolling Stones, there's a song by the Rolling Stones called You Can't Always Get What You Want. If you guys, I don't know if you heard that song. And so I would, I would sing that song to them, and they thought I made the song up, okay? And years later, they heard it on the radio, and it's like, hey, there's Dad's song. <laughs> so it, uh, but anyway, we had great fun as a family. We, you know, yes, there were some times we said no, but we also showed them the alternative. And the alternative to being a consumer and buying whatever you want, in our case, was to be a kingdom investor. And so we had amazing brothers and sisters from all over the world around our dinner table very often, telling about what God was doing there. And my kids, from the time they were a little bitty, were soaking that up and were hearing that. And as they grew, they kept hearing it. And then we took them on trips. So we didn't take the whole family to Disney World, but we took them to India and we took them to Turkey, and we took them several places in Africa. Um, and we, we took our kids to go see amazing brothers and sisters, seeing some history too, seeing some geography, but mainly seeing amazing brothers and sisters and being able to see why it is that we're living like we're living and what we're able to be part of. And my kids got it. None of my kids uh, felt like they were the victim of our choices and lifestyle. Um, some people say, um, let's see, I, I guess I haven't, I talked about giving away the company. Some people say, weren't your kids kind of hacked off about that? I mean, that was like their, their estate or their, their inheritance, and you just gave it away, and it was a lot of money. Um, we never saw it as our company. Everything belongs to God. They never saw it as their either. So they, they weren't seeing it as something that was their thing. It was God's thing that we were stewards of. So some of my kids now work in the company, and they are fellow stewards. And they, they are invited to come and participate, not as owners, but as stewards. And, uh, and we have many other non-family members who are also fellow stewards. The, um, some of you guys may think that that's crazy stuff. Why would, why would you do such a thing? That's just, that's just wrong. To us, it didn't, or, or, or maybe that's pretty cool, that's radical. To us, it didn't seem either of those. It seemed logical. Given what we believe about who God is, about what our tenure on this earth is, about what our tenure in heaven is, about where it all came from anyway, um, 
doing what we did seemed like logical steps. And when we transferred the stock of our company to a, um, away from our personal balance sheet, um, it was not some gut-wrenching experience to sign those papers. Um, it's, it changed our balance sheet, our personal balance sheet, a lot. It didn't change our life at all. We continued to push hard to grow the business and develop it, and since then it has, it has grown a lot. Um, we have found the lifestyle choices that we made set us free. When you put constraints in your life, sometimes that may sound like that's taking away your freedom. What we have found is putting godly constraints, particularly in this area of money, in our lives has led to freedom. And what I think, in, not just in money, but in lots of areas of life, living without constraints sounds like freedom, but it leads to bondage. And so I would, I, I, I was, God warned about this so much. It was a big deal. 2,000 years ago, when the standard of living was way less than what we have today. It's a big deal today. Um, the Jesus' warnings are not for a few rich guys. His warnings are for all of us, each of us. This whole thing of money can mess us up. And that's why we need to be, like Jesus said, watch out. Be on your guard. That's my encouragement to you today. Be on your guard. Read through what Scripture has to say about it and align your life with it. Um, and, and for some of you, you may start be getting nervous to think about doing that. And I want to say to you, God doesn't want your money. He wants you. He wants all of you. And because he wants all of you, he wants you to hold your money with an open hand. And when you don't, and when you say, this stuff is mine, well, it starts creating a separation between you and God. God wants you in a posture of um, unity with him and obedience to him for your sake, not because he wants your stuff. God has plenty of stuff. God doesn't need your money, but he allows us to be part of his work. He allows us to use our skills and gifts to serve people, to generate money that can be used to help others. He lets us in on it, and, and, uh, and that's what we have found. It's not been um, a, a disciplined struggle. If this had been super hard and, and took a tremendous amount of discipline to do this, I probably wouldn't have made it. I would have probably bailed out. Um, but, I, but God has, it's been a rich, abundant life, not a, not a struggle. You know, the, um, my brother and I have been partners for 37 years. We've never argued about money. It's like a miracle. I see so many families that get ripped apart in family business, not because there's not enough money, but because there's too much. And, and, there's, and they haven't thought it through, and they're doing what comes naturally, and that won't take you where you want to go. They're not heeding the warnings in Scripture. We're so thankful that he gave us those warnings before we had any money um, and, uh, and that we put those things in place because, you know, my wife and I have been married for 38 years. We've never argued about money. And, and for so many, that topic is a matter of turmoil. I think greed is one of the choice tools of our enemy. It's subtle. It's dangerous. It comes in in all kinds of different ways. It makes you maybe proud sometimes. It makes you feel like you don't have enough sometimes. There's, greed does all kinds of things to us. Generosity, holding what you have with an open hand, breaks the power of greed. And so my, my wish for you is not that uh, somehow I could find a way to extract some money from you for something. I don't want your money. 
I want for you freedom, the freedom that comes with a God who loves us. You know, in John 10.10, 10, it says, the thief comes to kill and steal and destroy. But I came to give you life, a rich, abundant life. And that's what I wish for you. And I do know that, um, and, and maybe here in Indonesia, you guys have, have taken care of this a long time ago, but I know in our country, there's a lot of folks that struggle in this area. And I'm suspecting that probably there's some here too, because, that, because Jesus warned about it so much. You know, we, we serve this amazing God who has blessed us in so many ways, but he's God. He's worthy of our total obedience, even if it means that things are hard, even if it means that it causes our life to end today. He's worthy of our total obedience, complete total obedience. He's God. He's also a loving heavenly father who wants to give us a rich, abundant life. And that's the life that we have found. And just thankful to you that we're allowed to come and share it. Um, we serve a great God together. And it's been a joy to be here with you. Can I, can I pray for you guys for just a minute? Father, we're thankful that you created us, that you forgave us, that you paid the penalty for that forgiveness. Thank you. Father, thank you for the scriptures. Thank you that, that you warned us, that you gave us encouragements, that you um, equipped us. Thank you for the scriptures. Father, we acknowledge that we are not our own. We have been bought with a price, a high price that you paid. We give ourselves to you, all of who we are. And Father, help us to do that more and more completely each day. Guide us, convict us, and thank you for our assurance that the God that we serve loves us more than we love ourselves, wants to bless us in many, many ways. Thank you that you do it. Father, I pray your blessing on those here today. In Christ's name, amen.